um, and we'll guide you through how to deal with the enforcement in Germany and what the backgrounds are. Um, so what I'll do is, first I, I will not be able to spare you a little bit of history in, in Germany, um, and then I'll look into the public sector or the administrative sector um, and the private sector. So I've differentiated just along the lines that you've heard about civic law and uh, civil law and all those things. Um, and how privacy is actually enforced in practice in Germany because the concept you've just heard about the last hour for in France but also in Germany with the administrative past but also the civil law past uh, has a significant effect on how privacy actually is handled in Germany and also for any of you who do business in Germany how uh, what you need to be careful with and, and what you need to look into and where you can do certain things and then um, at the end, if time allows, I'll give you a little bit of an outlook on what I think the GDPR will well, do to what we have in Germany at the moment. This one actually bridges quite well with what, what Russell just said. Um, so privacy is quite dear to many Germans, um, in part of because of our Nazi past. And while you said it was disrupt disrupted in 33 to 45, I think... Um, German tradition wasn't disrupted, but uh, 33 till 35, uh, 45 actually fit quite well into what we've had before. And it went on quite long, at least till 1968, that all the main positions anywhere in Germany were held um, by those that were in power in the Third Reich. But it's um, then there has been a little bit of a shift, fortunately, which mainly started in 68, and in 1970. Um, we saw the first privacy law in Germany, the first codified privacy law in one of the German states. Um, in 77, we got the first federal privacy law, which applied to everyone. And then we actually had many people going on the streets demonstrating in favor of privacy against a census we had in 1983. So that census also led to the development, again, I'm sort of picking up on what you said without us having discussed that in advance. Um, uh, it said there is a right to informational self-determination. Every individual has a right to do, well, to, to decide what their data can be used for and how it is used um, and, who, uh, and also how it is accessed. That is a significant basis of all the understanding in Germany on privacy. Because that, as a constitutional right, has the same status as freedom of speech or freedom of religion would have here. So it's, it's really, um, uh, at least on the legal side um, of looking at things, a core understanding of how things should be treated, which is actually just um, in part um, how it's then lived, but at least the understanding, the first approach towards it is always this informational self-determination. Then we had the reunification in 1989 following that, and um, another state with a lot of surveillance coming into Germany with, um, with uh, all that history around it, um, and um, that again shows that there is a deep distrust into what the state does with data. Um, and privacy is by many seen as, as basically the right to protect yourself against a surveillance state. And then, and actually I find it really striking that you did bring up the Lut decision, because um, that is all towards the state. But then um, we also got the opening of, of the law towards the Constitution, which is that we, um, we have... While we have those clear codes, uh, we've also said the Constitution helps interpre interpreting civil law, which is why, although it's just a, a law of privacy, basically just as a defense against an, a, a state or the government going into what you're doing, uh, it, it actually, um, we actually had the, the same development that it reached out to the, to the private sector, and we're saying if a private party does certain things that they shouldn't do because of certain infringements, again, of the right of information or self-determination, being one of them, then they can be stopped over, over doing that because you have to be able um, to uh, secure that right in any direction. That goes along with 
a deep skepticism towards new technology in Germany by many. So while there is, well, there is a lot of invention and so on, and we're going into stereotypes, that's terrible, that's still, um, it's, um, there is also a string of this, I'd, I'd say, sort of the Waldorf, uh, Montessori, whatever tradition that many of you sort of encounter when you want to, uh, when, want your kids to go to a different kind of kindergarten. And that's also in the society. So there is a deep distrust towards any new technologies. And um, um, that's sort of in conflict with all the new things that are coming up. Um, and um, there is this fear of new technologies and privacy, using, sort of using privacy as protecting um, against all those new and confusing things that we've seen in the last 20 years is uh, a strong factor. Um, specifically, if we walk, uh, talk, for example, about, about the works councils, which we're going to look at in a second. Um, so, shifting from the history, and I basically was just picking up from what you said, I'll give you another map. We've had various maps today. This one is Germany, and it's the 16 lender of Germany, the 16 states. And um, our regulatory landscape for privacy issues is one where we don't have just one privacy regulator. That's too simple. That's not, not for Germany. We have 16 lenders, so we have those regulators in each of those lenders. Then we have an additional federal data protection officer in charge of uh, the issues, of some of the issues as well. Um, so uh, we have the same law, and then we have 16 authorities applying them across Germany. Those um, actually also sometimes have quite a different approach towards it. For example, Bavaria is quite well known for being rather privacy, um, well, business friendly. While up in Kiel, up, far up in the north, uh, there's a regulator that's completely um, convinced that privacy is everything there is in the world and that you shouldn't listen to anyone who's, who just wants to make money because that's sort of obscene. Um, and um, their view is one that is really pushing back on, on any business interest. And they're really enforcing strongly. Same goes to my hometown, Hamburg, um, which is where, where, where Google is located. Um, they are also quite strict on any of the privacy issues and uh, not always easy to deal with. While it's right to say there is a bit of north-south, it's also um, we, we have certain groups that, well, certain specific, specific competences um, in, in various of these areas. And th those are important to know if you go to Germany. So if you have any case that happens to be in Germany, um, by choosing the right regulator, you may actually um, decide in advance on how things are going. For example, currently I'm working on a, a binding corporate rules mechanism where we have a German regulator as the binding authority. So that's uh, one of the ways of allowing you to have international data transfer. And we picked one where we've actually had uh, discussed that with various regulators. We were able to do that for various reasons. But we, we discussed it with very regulators what their view is. And, and it was actually possible to do, to do some forum shopping and to pick the one that was most, most open towards the solution that we're offering and actually is coordinate, uh, cooperating with us in a way that we're not seeing in England or in Ireland um, or even in France, where uh, all places are for BCR. This is the one regulator, and, and Field Fisher does a lot of those, um, uh, where all of a sudden we get things pushed through quite quickly because they think it's a good idea. Uh, then again, I would not recommend you'd ever go to Berlin with that because they're absolutely crazy about it. So um, that's where you get the same situation that you have in Europe uh, across those various countries, you get once again in Germany, and um, we love our independence of each of those states. Uh, and um, so that's something you can play with. Uh, and um, some have caught up in, have gotten caught up in it, uh, specifically in, in international cases um, where the regulators try to reach out to one of uh, one company which they didn't like, but they, they're not they don't happen to have an establishment in their state. And so um, while the rules under German law are basically quite clear, it, uh, the, the law applies, uh, at least at the moment, uh, to 
in, in relationship with your establishment. Um, and the rule under the existing European law is also clear. So you look into where someone established that law applies. If that's in Ireland, it's Irish law. If they happen to be uh, outside of Europe only and don't have uh, an establishment in Europe, it could be anywhere. But in, in general, you look into where they are. So that really annoyed various regulators because they wanted to go after the, the high profile cases. So they wanted to go after Facebook because they're an interesting company and it's a lot cooler to go after Facebook than to go after a hospital in, 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 in a small town. So uh, what they came up with is they said, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, privacy is also somewhat um, uh, a consumer issue. And um, they went to it uh, saying, okay, it's, it's also the marketplace where you're offering your product. And uh, moreover, uh, they said, we don't believe in Ireland if, if you don't have all your in infrastructure there, if it's just being passed through, if there's just a sales organization, then it's not a place of establishment anyway. The second part, actually, I can sort of understand. Um, uh, and it's probably the same argument you would get under tax law. So you probably have to look into it when you establish in Europe how to do it correctly on the privacy perspective. Um, anyway, so that's where um, they picked it up and said, okay, while we have all those Euro nice European laws, we still have an applicability of, um, of German law uh, because of the marketplace where you are actually operating. So with that background of having all those um, regulators across Germany, and, uh, and actually I just wanted to mention one more thing, there is a group called Dusseldorfer Kreis. They're very important if you talk about privacy law in Germany. Uh, that's a group where all the regulators come together twice a year and basically decide on all the overarching cases in, in uh, Germany. If you want, with your company, to be active in Germany and this being a US company, my advice is to try and get a decision by the Dusseldorfer Kreis or by a subcommittee of their, theirs that a specific regulator is actually in charge of you. They do that, they've done that a lot um, in the past, and that's something where you can actually help getting the right steer into how you want the regulation to be uh, for your company. And, and Jules just mentioned AOL a while ago, uh, or that we worked for a while ago. So for example, what we did for AOL back then was we went to the regulator and said, we'd like you to be our regulator. We don't want any of the others in Germany. All the communication gets, should go through you. And uh, by doing so, we made sure um, that we didn't get different decisions across all those various jurisdictions in Germany. And that actually was very helpful because they sort of pulled all the decisions to them. Um, and it also helped us to establish you know, a good relationship with them, but I'm going to go into how to deal with the regulator in practice in a second. So if, if we look at the regulator, and, and now this, uh, I have been, or we have been uh, forced to be a little stereotypical anyways, but this is even more stereotypical than uh, what, what I've been, but still. So there are certain things that the German regulators are facing. The first one is, or that they like, whatever, uh, however you want to see it. The first one is um, the regulators pride their independence, although there are certain um, well, I'd say things where they're maybe not that, that independent because of the way they're, uh, they're paid, etc. They're generally, structurally, absolutely independent. They can take their own decision. There's no um, authority above them that, that can tell them what to do. And that's something that's very important for them and should be, well, at least kept in mind when you're talking to them. Because one thing they really hate is some Americans coming uh, in and telling them what to do and how to do it right. Even if you know, it's better to, to um, be quiet about it and uh, sort of uh, show them that, you, uh, that they're the ones that are independent. This goes further. Um, there is, uh, if, so there is this state official in Germany called Beamter. And um, once you are a state official, you're in a job you usually never change for the rest of your life. So that's something every judge and, and most of the ones that are deciding are in this position, which is highly independent. You can probably basically not 
uh, once you have that contract, it cannot be terminated anymore. It's almost impossible to fire a professor from university. It's almost impossible to fire a judge. It's almost impossible to fire anyone with a regulator. Um, and they can, you know, they can have a real drinking issue. They can, have, you know, they can basically do anything. They will not lose their job. The good thing about it is that this provides a lot of safety and security and always going forward. The bad thing is we have not, no such thing as a revolving door. Once you're in there, it's like the Hotel California. Once you're in, you never get out. So that's the same thing here. Once you are in, uh, in this trail, and that's not normally um, decided before you're 30 years old, you will not change again. Um, and that also leads to a certain not so business friendly mindset because most of them simply don't get it. Um, and then they try to get it and they, they explain you how to do business and that's always ridiculous um, because they simply, um, for example, well, there are a lot of examples, but anyways, it, it's just uh, difficult for them um, to understand that and there's a bridge to gap with them um, to move forward. I, I've just had a regulator ask me a couple of weeks ago whether we could recommend someone for his data protection office for, um, for one of the lender because he doesn't just want all those the privacy activists at his office. He, he just likes someone who's sort of reasonable. But um, it's, uh, uh, those people would probably, uh, well, uh, there's a certain draw with the public service to those people who, who want the security. If you leave the public office, this has a significant effect on your pensions. Um, because you're not being paid that well, but you've got a fantastic pension. So even, even that's a real disadvantage. Again, that's why there's such a draw into it, and it impacts the decisions uh, and the motivation of uh, the regulators significantly. Um, the, other one, the, the next thing is, I've, I've talked about the Dusseldorf Kreis. So um, it's also this peer pressure who is the toughest, uh, who, can, who can really issue the hardest guide, uh, decisions. And when they come up with a decision, it's often, um, even before the company that is concerned knows about it, they learn about it from the press. Um, because they, they're so proud of the fact that they've stood up against Google or whomever, um, that they issue the press release uh, even before anyone is informed because they want to show all their peers that um, uh, they, they've really been active. Um, so that's, that's one side, but you can also play with it to a certain degree because they're always short on money and they're always understaffed. And so um, if you get inquiries by the regulators, one of the ways of dealing with it is just bombarding them with, with material and not answering all questions that they're asking. Um, because um, they only have a certain amount of hours they're able to put into a case. And as long as it's not a real high-profile pro case, again, you know, as long as it's not Google or Samsung or, or, or Facebook, but someone that's smaller, um, there's, a quite, there's quite some likelihood that you'll get away with it uh, by just giving them you know, the information which you've filtered, uh, which you think you'd like to share, and withholding the information which may not be that optimal. Uh, there is a, obviously, there's an issue with that because if they find out about it, one, surprise, surprise, they're not quite happy. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it is really about being, you know, finding, the, bridging the right gap. Um, and then um, it's still uh, possible to go like that. Um, so, yeah. Um, exactly. The enforcement style in Germany, for, based on those regulators, or by those regulators, is one where I say it's a mixture. Most of the time, it starts off very formal. You'll receive a letter that really sounds aggressive. You know, it tells you, uh, we found out the following things. Uh, we're going to find you really severe. You know, there, you may go to prison over it. And, um, and, and by the way, here's our press release on it. And um, it really comes out very... Uh, the first letter is always is one where you know, I get a call by a client that's like uh, under complete shock because they're gonna th they, they think it's an absolute catastrophe that this just happened. And then um, that's basically just setting the negotiation. And that's something you need, you know, that helps to know. This is just setting the tone initially and showing, yeah, we can do something. Actually, once you get started 
and pick that up and say, oh, yes, we take that serious and uh, we've got to talk about it, but we think we've done the following thing and you explain what you do. The whole thing often shifts significantly um, and you get really, uh, you can start a real friendly discussion on things. Um, and one of the ways of approaching it, which I recommend, is to go there and establish a trust early. Go there as a company. Go to the regulator that you think is going to be in charge of, of you and present them what you're doing. So you have a product where you think, okay, this is health data. It's really complicated and, and, and any health data is always sensitive and, and dangerous to deal with. Uh, or you have financial data or, um, or you have a new internet product like a social network. Um, it, it's maybe it's a very good idea actually to go to some of them and tell them we know that this is all difficult we know there are many things but we care about privacy and this is what we're doing and not just tell them after anything has happened but it, tell them in advance they they love to talk because they sit in their room just that, as I've shown you on the previous picture that's how they sit well not quite but just just about that's how they sit in their room so they're always so happy if someone calls them and tells them about what they're doing and, and sort of involves them, that if they uh, then later on receive a complaint by some crazy German who said, my data is not treated correctly, they'll know, well, maybe, but let, you know, I, I think I know them and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. So um, it's something you can anticipate. Uh, and um, by presenting what you're doing yourself, you can also choose what you're going to present. So the things whatever, um, where you're safe, they're better to present than the ones that are really tacky. Um, but that's something where you can, but because it's, the process is under your own control, you, it's, it's absolutely in your hand how to deal with the regulator at this place. Mm. Another thing about the enforcement is we've, we've heard a lot about the legal system. I didn't have the slide on there because actually uh, all the courts that we're talking about, at least on the public side, are not significant because just about no case has been decided on uh, privacy issues, at least on the easier stuff. So there are several outstanding constitutional court cases that are important. And there may be 10, 15, or 20 of them um, that, are, that really deal with privacy. Then there are some in the employment context. But that's just about it. So not just, you know, that's nothing that happens every day. It's something that happens maybe four or five cases a year. So that's why the legal system, while it's very interesting, is not that significant for how your decisions are taken because there are not that many. The way the regulator enforces what they're doing on that end is they publish everything or all the cases they've had in a yearly report. It's a thick report from each of those 16 lenders um, where they give you a lot of information about how they've decided and why they have decided certain things. And that's actually also the source of uh, where you find a lot of good advice or where you can provide advice because that's where they tell you how they think um, about various uh, topics. Uh, then again, across the 16 lender with different opinions, but um, th that's the main source of information on, on privacy um, within those reports. However, there are obviously still, in spite of those reports, there are certain enforcement mechanisms. There, 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 are, there is a potential of fines. Um, so we've had a fine for the, uh, of, of 1.5 million for the Deutsche Telekom on a case. We, we've had some rather significant cases. Most of the fines, however, if ever any are issued, are rather low and more a warning. Um, but it's most of the time, at this point of time, are, they're not high. The regulators that I've talked to are excited about the fact that the fines go up and uh, think that it really, uh, with the GDPR, and they think that, that it will really uh, change the way they can approach privacy. So we, we'll see what happens. Um, my expectation is that in some high profile cases, we will see high fines uh, just to show that this is possible. Uh, and then probably for the smaller cases, it'll remain as it is at this moment. Um, but. Uh, you know, if, if you have a significant data breach, I would not rely on saying, well, probably not, they're not going to change a lot. My view is that actually is going to change quite a bit. Um, 
As I said, the other thing they're using is publicity. So publishing any re publishing the reports, publishing press releases um, is a thing they like to do. Mm, and uh, for example, uh, that goes with those, those questionnaires. Um, when uh, following safe harbor, uh, in already in December, uh, the some of the regulators send out questionnaires to everyone on the safe harbor list uh, in, their, in their land, uh, to every company that has a subsidiary there, asking them about what did you do following safe harbor? Did you implement any new things? So that, uh, they send that out to everyone, just uh, probably put some trainee on it, and they send out those letters. Um, as you know, in, in December, that was only a few months after the decision, many companies didn't really, um, well, ha hadn't really gotten their act together. Uh, on how to re react to uh, the dismissal of, of um, safe harbor. So that led to a lot of panic. Um, but that's sort of a typical action that they like to take. And then a month later, so uh, I think there was a four week uh, period to respond. A month later, they already they, they, uh, published a press release. Okay, there are five companies that didn't make it, uh, that don't have it, uh, and they're gonna go after them. This, the part that wasn't published on this one was, then of those five, uh, in the end, no one had to pay any fines. And in the end, they were all okay. They just had an additional meeting with a regulator telling them, well, this is what we did do, and this is what we think we're compliant. Anyways, even if we haven't put model clauses in place yet, this is what we're on the way to it. And then they were happy and everything dissolved. But we had, we had the, we, we, the regulator was, possible, was able to show that they've been active. They had a nice press release. Everyone talked about them. I, I know most of my clients are, or many of my clients are from Silicon Valley. I got a lot of calls on that day because you know, it was in all newsletters. And everyone said, oh, they're starting, they're starting, they're starting. Um, but in the end, it was all you know, not uh, done as uh, terribly as it looked like. Um, there also is the possibility of dawn rates. We've had that. The regulator just showed up, shows up at the door. It doesn't happen often, but so there are various enforcement mechanisms that you may encounter uh, when you deal in Germany. Um, and it goes up to um, actually sending people to, to jail, but that has never happened so far. Aside from the, and this is actually the part that I find more interesting, is that we don't just have the privacy data protection regulators, those 16 or 17 if we count the Federal Data Protection Officer. We also, uh, regulated, we also have various, um, well, subsectors, basically are a little bit comparable to some of the things w that you have in, in the US where we have on health law, uh, a specific uh, uh, regulator that is in charge, or a regulator that's also in charge in, to, of looking into privacy issues of health data. And then we have a, re a regulator very strict regulator, by the uh, way, where I wouldn't recommend just you know sort of being nice and then you'll get it all solved on the financial issues. If you have, if you're a bank, um, then you you have privacy laws which are very different to the privacy laws that we're seeing uh, in, under the German Data Protection Act. Mm. And um, same goes for telecommunication. So that that, that was another nice case. Um, we, we have a breach, general breach notification law in Germany, which 90% of the breaches um, you will not have to report under them because there are so many ways out of it. It's very um, soft. And then there is a telecommunication, uh, the Telecommunication Act that also has a breach notification law, somewhere actually quite hidden. Uh, but you need to know that if you, if you uh, offer telecommunications, which could actually be also an email service, um, uh, and then you have a, quite a different statute on, on, on breach notification. So that's, um, uh, again, that, that's where we have other public areas that enforce privacy law uh, that go way beyond what we have in the other areas. And sometimes when you get the feeling that privacy law is so very, very strict and everything is different in Germany, um, which I completely doubt, it's, um, uh, the reason for that is that you may actually have to do with some of those specific laws which are more strict uh, or, yeah, so that's one of uh, the things in the background of it. 
Um, we also have on data security a very German long rule set uh, of files and files and files um, uh, where it goes about the security of your systems. Uh, that's the BSI. Um, and the newest player, because somehow privacy is charming, um, the newest player is, uh, are the cartel offices who have picked up that if you use data and if you collect data, that's just basically just like money. And it's an abuse of dominant power, um, uh, of a market dominance, uh, if you um, abuse the data or use it wrong. So a breach of privacy law could be, in their view, an abuse of the market dominant power for certain companies. And so they, they, they're going after some. And I think we'll see more of that because um, that's something where they all already have an angle to get into with very high fines. And while many companies may dismiss privacy as not being significant, cartel law is something that all companies worldwide understand. It's like, if that happens, okay, that's, uh, now we've really got to be careful. And that's um, in, uh, in part why this is so significant that this has come up. Uh, if you have them, the question obviously is who, who is in charge? Uh, is it, wh whom are you going to talk to? Um, and uh, um, so, I've, just to give you another example, when we dealt with local, uh, localized data, um, lo location-based services, um, we had to speak with three regulators. It was a federal data protection authority, um, it was because they're in charge of certain telecommunication issues. It was the authority in charge of the networks because they, you know, that's also where certain things are um, in there of the mobile networks. Or that's data that's used for location-based services. And we had to talk to the local regulators because it's also telemedia. It's also an internet service. So at the same time, we had three regulators in charge who all thought this is really an interesting uh, topic and we really want to discuss it. Um, and so actually in this case, we managed to bring them all together in a room and negotiate things there with all three of them. But it's, um, that does happen actually more often than anyone would like. So having talked about the public, uh, the public part of it. And yeah, quick question. sure, Eric. Exactly. The precursor to the network information security directive. Yeah. Uh, that takes the concept of breach notification and actually talks about requiring notification of interruption of key services. Do you Correct. see that as being uh, you know, a significant factor we need to think about as well, too? Yeah, so that IT security law we've had is um, a rather specific law that doesn't apply to many companies, but probably that does apply to Cisco, um, uh, because it's only for those that provide an IT infrastructure for governmental services. Um, and uh, there is, as you said, there is the right of disrupt disrupting the traffic, which is absolutely troubling um, from a privacy perspective, but that's there. And um, I'm, I, personally, I'm not sure whether the, the law will actually be able to be upheld um, in the constitutional court, but it's, there, there is a big issue around it. It's, um, that's right. So, um, it's, it's a bit of a different element thing, but you're right. So, but I, aside from the regulators that we've talked about, where I said they're just not that, in the end, uh, they're interesting, but maybe not even that effective, uh, aside from the fact that they can make a lot of fuss. Um, there's, there are certain groups or rights holders that are maybe even more threatening. The first one, uh, consumer protection agencies. Consumer protection agencies are either uh, are private organizations, so they're not state organizations. Often it's just a couple of lawyers that actually get together. You need eight because then you have a per ein, a group, um, and uh, they can go out and send out warning letters if you breach law. For example, they like to go through all the imprints and see whether in the imprint you've mentioned everything that you have to mention. Or they, what they loved to do for a while was going through privacy policy and look whether um, a certain wording on Google that Google had agreed with the Hamburg regulator on their um, Google, on Google Analytics, whether that's in your privacy policy. If not, they can send you a letter, a warning letter, 
and they can uh, send you an invoice directly afterwards. So sort of they send out a letter. It's very easy. It's, it's easy money. Um, and, and so many lawyers have actually specialized on doing those things. Um, it's not all, all that. Some of them really also take it very serious. So they are in there for consumer protection. There are groups um, that attack bigger companies um, because they think consumer protection is important. And consumer protection entails, uh, at least in a, if we take it shortly, entails privacy law. So they can, if, if you breach privacy law, this organization can come up and say, you're suing privacy laws. For example, that has happened to, to Apple um, and their terms and conditions and their privacy policies that went to court and a lot of it had to be changed. Mm, again, with a lot of publicity around it. Samsung, their smart TV, they had a decision there. Uh, it's only the first instance at this moment, but also uh, that concerned, uh, Apple concerned the consent language. It was not clear enough, the transparency issues. Samsung concerned the length of the privacy policy was too long, too many words, so they had to cut that down. Um, uh, and then Google um, received warning letters by consumer protection agencies on, on the scanning of email content. Maybe some other company could have uh, caught that too, maybe even closer to really doing that. So um, there are various, uh, so those consumer protection agencies are another player uh, where it's important to be able to defend them. And they also give out, that's an organization all, by all of them together, they have the Big, Big Brother Award. So they nominate some company every year with, you know, with a big pro press conference and so on and hand over a Big Brother Award to the scariest uh, uh, company on privacy issues that they can come up with and present that case. It's mostly lawyers. Um, they, so they have an interesting relationship to each other. The consumer protection agencies, especially the ones that are a little bigger and actually more professional, uh, they compete with the uh, data protection authorities. So Samsung Smart TV is an interesting example there. So for, for Samsung, there was a decision by the regulators, a big paper on how Smart TV should be treated. Um, and a big guideline. And um, uh, the consumer protection agencies took a different angle and went far beyond what the agreement with the regulators actually was and pushed for far more. So that's an example where uh, they didn't cooperate that much, but they wanted to show that they can reach more. And so they took it to court while the regulators didn't. Or, well, it was taken to court, or it is, it is at court now. The next one. Um, our competitors. So um, any competitor on the market can sue someone else who's in the same market over unfair trade practices. Um, and uh, the breach of privacy law is also a breach, is also unfair competition because it says you're just sort of skipping the rules that you should be following. Um, and um, that's something that's always a threat, however, normally companies would not um, go to court over privacy issues in that context because, it's, that's one simple reason, because no one really gets it right. So uh, when, when you talk about it and you, 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 the clients come up, oh, we really we want to you know, make life harder for the others, uh, we always ask them, so how about you? Did you uh, how, are, how about your practices? Do you, do, are you safe? And w once they start looking into it, most of them say, oh, well, we'd rather look for something else. Um, the only places where we really get that is, or where we sometimes get it, is um, if you want to, if companies want to block the market entry of a U.S. player. So a bigger one that we've just seen recently was a streaming portal coming in from the U.S. And, uh, to, to Germany. They, uh, they had a German electronic chain like Best Buy, it wasn't Best Buy, was someone like them. They wanted to have a cooperation agreement with them that U.S. player didn't want to sign the negotiation, uh, didn't want to sign that agreement. So what they did is say, they really looked deeply into their privacy aspects and sued them over it. 
because they were just entering the market, there was a lot that had to be done, and it was basically just to gain negotiation power. But that's where I see competitors coming in. Um, and if they do, or sometimes something that is also done is uh, the good thing for the competitor is it's a right that you can enforce very quickly. So you send out a cease and desist letter with a three or four or five day um, deadline to respond and say we're not going to do this anymore. If, if you're not responding in that deadline, they can go to court without an oral hearing and um, uh, get a, an, an injunction. And then the oral fo hearing follows and so on and so on. So there, there is a legal process, but it's a very quick and very cheap and very efficient way um, to stop someone, uh, to stop a competitor from doing what they are doing. Uh, which is, again, why it is so dangerous um, and why it's so important to know that this may happen. Uh, on the other hand, why it's also maybe a very nice tool for one of you if you want to, if you're annoyed with one of your competitors. Um, last but not least of those players we have in the market, um, uh, we have the data subjects. Um, they are the ones who, well, you know, the ones you know, Max Schrems, he was in Germany, he was Austrian, so it doesn't really count. But it's sort of this character. Uh, we have Patrick Breyer, who just uh, fought for a decision on IP addresses. Um, and we have a lot of those activists in Germany who, um, who like to make your life just out of principle, a little more difficult than it needs to be. Um, and uh, Patrick Bryan, that's why I brought up the P Piratenpartei. So the Piratenpartei, they're actually a party. They've sort of lost very much on their attention. But they're actually in a couple of our uh, local parliaments by now um, that uh, have, well, they started off with saying we shouldn't have any copyright at all. And you know, they started off in Sweden, but we, sort of together with this Pirate Bay thing um, and, and the free exchange of data. Uh, very free exchange of any data, even copyright protected data. And so they, they're a party that has privacy basically as one of the main core interests of, um, uh, well, of pushing. Um, and so many of those that are member of those parties, they like to use their personal rights to write interesting letters to to often just to the call center and then it gets escalated very lately to the legal departments and the legal departments then have a day or two, two to respond and if they don't um, or then it's um, it's escalated even further so they pick that up uh, the, the other data subjects that are significant are organized and works councils so works councils and HR have found out that with an international transfer of HR data, you often enter into issues as well. Because um, um, work councils, you look for the things where they have some power over the company. And on data transfers, they can be very strong and can be quite an impediment on any data transfer project that you have internally. So, and it is in their power to look into what, how you treat data in your company, uh, and they like to do that um, because they can. And it's um, negotiating with works council would be a topic of an own presentation. There, there are a lot of things you can do about them, um, but maybe again I can talk to that later. On the other hand, in, we have a role in Germany which is now going to come to everyone in Europe that more significantly dealing with data is the data protection officer. The data protection officer shifts the responsibility from the public authority to the company. Just about every company in Germany, at least every significant company with more than 20 employees, has to have a data protection officer. And we've had that for over 30 years. So there is an expert, a privacy expert, or supposed a privacy expert in every company, which in my opinion is the main reason why people think privacy law is so different in Germany for, and it's so much harder than anywhere else because there's always someone in this company saying, I've, I know something about privacy and you can't do that. Um, and that's sort of internally escalated. My personal experience with data protection officers is internal data protection officers, at least in the past, often were the ones who didn't run away fast enough or um, who were the ones who uh, 
uh, did not know enough about privacy, actually, or did know, not know enough for their normal job. So uh, they reacted to it and said, okay, we're going to put them there as privacy officer because they can't do any harm. Now that has changed quite significantly in the last couple of years because privacy has gained so much more importance. And um, the, uh, those persons that no one ever listened to and they were in a window with, uh, room without windows, they all of a sudden were turned into quite significant players in, uh, on the privacy field. Um, and often they have no clue about how you really do things. They had a three-day training and that's it. And then they're supposed to give advice for the entire company, again, specifically for the smaller ones. It's not true for the big ones anymore, but for the smaller one it is. So that's just another factor. And um, I think my time's up.